This year is the 30th anniversary of the first Jurassic Park film. However, the original source material that inspired the film, written by Michael Crichton, was released in 1990. Jurassic Park the novel was a huge piece of science fiction that changed the world forever. With the anniversary of the Jurassic Park film on the horizon, I thought it would be a good idea to revisit this book from my past. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about my thoughts on the Jurassic Park novel. Stars and Stripes! Hello and welcome to another Carrot Scraps video, and by another I mean the 140th. So of course, as usual before we get into the review, I wanted to give a couple of disclaimers up front. This video is the beginning of a series of reviews that I want to do on the channel. I want to go through as much Jurassic media as possible, and I'm going to try to do it in somewhat of a chronological order. So where else would I start other than the beginning as I saw it, the first Jurassic Park book? This is not the first time I've read Jurassic Park, and technically I did not read Jurassic Park, I listened to the audiobook for this review. Read. Something else I wanted to mention is that I'll be doing a lot of comparisons between this book and the movie adaptation from 1993. I'm sure that's not a surprise to many of you, but I know that there are some people out there who would rather that not be the case, and I wanted to give you that context going in. In addition, while I assume most people watching the video have either read the book or watched the film, let's talk a little bit about the book's events before we get into my thoughts. If you haven't read the book and have only watched the movie, you should be mostly fine with my review. Because most of the book is pretty similar to the film, with some drastic changes in the finale and some character changes here and there. But the general plot of Jurassic Park is as follows. A wealthy entrepreneur has funded a scientific venture that has accomplished cloning dinosaurs. And the circumstances of the story of Jurassic Park debates the ethics and the intricacies of that science, in addition to whether the result of that science can be controlled or trusted or not. John Hammond is the name of the wealthy man funding this project, and he's using these cloned miracles to create a theme park, somewhat of a zoo for prehistoric animals. And the main plot of the book follows protagonists Alan Grant, Ellie Sattler, and Ian Malcolm as they visit this park to determine whether it's safe or not. And in the end, it turns out that it isn't. Now, like I mentioned, if you've watched the movie, you know most of that synopsis already, but there are the occasional details that do differ from the film. For example, at the end of the book, the island is bombed, presumably killing the dinosaurs there. In addition, there are multiple plots throughout the entire novel that follow the idea of dinosaurs making it to the mainland, an idea that becomes prominent throughout the rest of the Jurassic films, but that isn't present in that first movie. There are also big character changes, like for example, I think John Hammond in the movie is far more naive and whimsical. He makes some mistakes, but he's mostly misguided and not mean-hearted. However, in the book, I think he's much more jaded. And those are just some of the big differences between the book and the movie, and I highly recommend you check out the book for yourself. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's talk about my feelings on the Jurassic Park novel by Michael Crichton. So, I just finished reading Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park from 1990, and I thought it was incredible. Uh, first of all, let me just say, I didn't finish reading it. Uh, I technically was rereading it, and I technically wasn't reading it at all. I was listening to an audiobook. Uh, but I had a great time listening to it, um, and it was very refreshing coming back to that story uh, with way more years of Jurassic Park under my belt um, as a fan and being into the other parts of the franchise. And then on top of that, as somebody who has just kind of grown up and learned uh, a lot more about the world in general, about the world in general, but also about dinosaurs, sure, and also about science and also about political debates, um, there's a lot that I really appreciate about this book um, coming back to it. And I have to say, I feel like it's hands down one of my favorite books now. Uh, I'm excited to revisit it. I, like, it's one of those books that I finished and then I want to do it again. Um, I was never bored uh, while listening to it. Um, it. It was entertaining the entire time. And maybe it wasn't entertaining for the reasons you might think it is. Uh, like, I, I, the, so I guess the first thing I want to talk about, it's hard to kind of pick one thing to go into first, but the first thing I wanted to talk about is that uh, I was kind of surprised that, you know, the Jurassic, so the Jurassic Park films are very action driven, right? Uh, action or horror driven, you could say, somebody could make the argument for. Um, but this book, uh, while there were many hor horrific sequences with dinosaurs and dinosaur violence and attacks, and while there were many uh, action sequences, 
Um, I felt like the greatest conflict in the book didn't have anything to do with the dinosaurs. In fact, when they started introducing the dinosaurs, unlike the Jurassic Park film, um, where the film kind of introduces, you know, the dinosaur, the first full shot of a dinosaur as this majestic, beautiful thing, in the book, it's a lot more mundane. It is a surprise. It is kind of a... Uh, you know, somebody mistakes something for something else. Um, and so it is a little surprising from that point of view, but really it's almost a blink and you'll miss it moment. However, in contrast to that, the most interesting part of the book is that the greatest focus and drama is put more on the science of the book, which shouldn't be surprising if you look into Michael Crichton at all and you know his credentials when it comes to the world of science. Um, but I can't say this enough. Like, I'm not just saying this, like, it's, it's really the main point of the book is the science. Um, theorizing about science and uh, having scientific twists about what created the, these dinosaurs and the way they behave. These are the most dramatic moments in the book, um, and it's very interesting coming from the movies where the most dramatic moments are where a character is about to be eaten, right? Or where they're running away. In the book, it really isn't the case. Uh, you know, that really isn't the case. Uh, the most exciting parts are when, you know, data is being read out and when you're learning that a character um, is learning something or that they're sharing information that they knew um, and these theories are developing or theories are being proposed. Uh, at multiple points throughout the book, uh, a theory is explained or expressed and then a conclusion is made and that is treated with way more drama as a twist than any sudden appearance of a dinosaur. And I just thought that was one of the most interesting parts of the book. It wasn't necessarily something that I was, you know, uh, that I didn't know what, like existed in the book, right? Like obviously I know how Michael Crichton writes and I know kind of his main uh, ideas and philosophies when going into this, but I guess I, I didn't realize how dramatically uh, different the focus of the book was. Uh, even though there are sequences of dinosaur danger, that really isn't the main focus of the book. It's almost a background thing, at least in my opinion. The main focus of this book is the science, and at least speaking for myself, that's not boring at all. I was never bored listening to this book and reading this book. Um, I was, because of the way that it was written, uh, and, and some stuff I knew and some stuff I didn't know, but because of the way this information was written and because of the way the story was written, I felt compelled when these characters, uh, you know, experienced these twists. I can't stress enough how surprised I was by this style of writing and how entertaining it was to listen to and to read. Um, I really, really engaged with it. And again, it sounds kind of boring, I'm sure some people might think, but to me it was really, really engaging. And I'm really excited to check out more Michael Crichton novels as a result. Obviously, I'm gonna check out The Lost World after this and we're gonna do a video on it, but I also wanna check out his other science fiction. I really wanna check out uh, The Sphere, I believe it's called, after this. And it's because I'm hoping that it's written in a similar way, that it approaches this science fiction from a science you know, perspective. Um, from my research, Michael Crichton did get his doctorate. He graduated uh, medical school from, from my research, but never practiced. I could be wrong on that, but to my knowledge, he does have his PhD. He graduated from Harvard, but he never, uh, again, practiced. He went right into writing shortly after that. Um, again, if, I, if I'm wrong on that, I apologize, but from that understanding to me, that means that he is somebody who is well studied, he is somebody who is a doctor, or at least is, you know, experienced in the world, uh, the world of doctors and, uh, you know, science and medical science and, and that kind of world, uh, and so bringing that to his science fiction is really interesting, um, you know, science fiction is typically, you know, very difficult to uh, explain, I think. Uh, I think a lot of people just think science fiction is, you know, we put a time machine in our uh, story and now it's science fiction. And I, I guess to an extent it can be. Some people like to call that maybe f science fantasy if it doesn't work. But to my knowledge, the idea of science fiction is, you know, the point of your story is the science, is the, si the real world science being twisted in a fun, interesting, uh, uh, fictional way. Maybe fun isn't important to that, but the point being that like, there's a real world science that's being fictionalized and part of the story that makes it, you know, part of that genre is the kind of real elements, the elements that are similar to our world. Uh, so again, it's not just a, ca a car that's like really advanced that makes it science fiction, right? Um, it, it, there's a, there, there is a science 
element in our world that is present in this fictional world that's kind of twisted. Um, and I feel like that's what I saw in this novel a lot, uh, in, in Jurassic Park a lot, and I feel like that's what Michael Crichton brought to the table. Um, oftentimes he was talking about uh, the patterns of animals and, you know, animal science. Uh, the amount of, you could take a drinking game with this book uh, every time somebody says, uh, you know, um, popular science says this, like they'll, they'll think about something, they'll experience something. And the first thing that their brain does is think of, Hmm, I read a paper that said this once, but it couldn't be. Uh, I always thought that was funny. Um, a big criticism of science fiction is often that, uh, because it, and real science fiction, uh, because it is mostly about these ideas, um, the dialogue and the story isn't always the best. Uh, and that's because the focus of the story isn't on writing perfect dialogue or, 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 you know, getting chemistry across. It's to express these big ideas. And they're often written by people who maybe they aren't the best at writing dialogue. Uh, they're just people who understand these science uh, uh, concepts, which is why they're good at writing science fiction, uh, you know, more than maybe dramatic fiction or something like that. Um, and I think that's true of a lot of science fiction. I think a lot of science fiction is celebrated for the scientists, sci scientific uh, elements of the story rather than the uh, dialogue. And a lot of the times these adaptations of these stories uh, to film or to uh, television will kind of hone those rougher edges, right? We'll add charisma, we'll add better dialogue and we'll you know shape the story a little bit better. Um, however, that being said, I feel like Jurassic Park, while it wasn't incredible when it came to the social aspects of the story, when it came to the dialogue when it came to the uh, storytelling. I didn't think it was, you know, groundbreaking or perfect, but I also thought it was very serviceable. I never really thought that it was poorly written from that perspective. Maybe a little dull, um, but never bad. Um, and it wasn't dull as in like boring, it was just dull in terms of like, uh, it, you know, it wasn't inspired. And that's because what, what Michael Crichton really wanted to write, in my opinion, were these other sequences where these doctors um, and these scientists were exchanging ideas uh, rather than kind of the, uh, you know, plot points of the story. Um, and there are certain plot points in this story that I'm not the biggest fan of. Uh, the biggest one being whether uh, the raptor is gonna make it to the mainland. Um, and they're on this boat, and so, uh, you know, uh, Alan Grant is trying to survive with the kids, but they keep thinking about the boat, and I'm just like, I mean, I think you're in enough danger as it is, I don't think we need this added danger. I will admit that they do kind of hang a lantern on this towards the end of the story, uh, where, I, I don't know what the line is, but they basically say, like, that wasn't really the main danger, right? Like, an animal getting onto the mainland. Uh, so there might be some commentary there, and I accept that, I think I see what the commentary is, but there were definitely many moments in the story where they thought about the raptor on the boat and how they have to call into the mainland. And I just thought it was a little odd because the present situation they were in was already tense enough. I didn't need some new external uh, tension from there. Um, and then I guess every now and again, I just felt like the characters could feel like they were in a little bit more peril. It felt like everybody was very lost in thought uh, when it came to science. Even, you know, the kids uh, felt like a, a little lost in thought when it came to the science. Uh, but other than that, I thought the writing, you know, was serviceable in that perspective. But in the greater perspective and the stuff that I really liked when it came to the discussion of ideas, when it came to the twists involving hypotheses around scientific ideas in real life combined with this fictional one, uh, and when it came to kind of testing these ideas ideas, all of that stuff, and, and learning about how the park ran, um, you know, learning about the mundane systems that eventually snowball and have a domino effect into this catastrophic uh, system, um, all of that stuff was super compelling and exactly why I want to read more Michael Crichton and exactly what made this book uh, work tremendously well for me. Two of my favorite parts of this book that I think kind of encapsulate this idea uh, are these are, are centered around these two quotes and I'll start with the one that's a little sillier uh, there's a quote and excuse me if I get it wrong towards the end of the book where somebody says I think it might be Ellie uh, says maybe the dinosaurs are weird uh, they're looking at these uh, raptors and they're acting in a way that they don't understand this whole book they've been watching these dinosaurs and they're you know in their heads they're like oh well some say that primates do this or some say that modern birds do that perhaps these dinosaurs are doing the same like uh, and that happens over and over and over it's very funny uh, but it's interesting and then in this final moment, they're like, I have no idea why they're doing this. And they just think maybe the dinosaurs are weird. And I just think that's a funny quote in general. But then for the actual subtext of what that quote means, you know, it's just fascinating that these dinosaurs are potentially just a different species. You know, uh, there's another quote in the book, uh, again, excuse me if I get this wrong, uh, dinosaurs aren't lizards or birds, uh, they're as varied as mammals are. And that connects with this perfectly, where it's like, we're trying to 
contextualize these animals, uh, these animals with what we know about uh, modern science and what we know about uh, projected science, uh, animals that we have experience with, the context that we know of our world. But the fact is we have no idea what these animals are. And while we can predict most uh, if not many of, if not none of the you know, the patterns of these animals, um, there are some behaviors we'll never ever know. And they do figure out what this behavior is, but I like this acceptance of maybe they're just weird. And that basically meaning not that it's weird, but just that like, it's weird to us because we'd never have any context for this. We'd never know what this is. And I just love this idea um, that, you know, this debate over lizards versus uh, din uh, uh, lizards versus birds uh, over what a dinosaur is, right? Um, and how it's basically like, well, no, I mean, mammals are so incredibly different and that's what dinosaurs are. You're thinking of dinosaurs wrong if you're just trying to argue whether they are a bird or whether are, uh, they are a lizard. Um, and at the end of the day, you can predict out all you want, uh, but some of their behaviors are just going to be weird to you because they're completely alien and you just don't have the context to understand what they are and how they behave. And then the other uh, big quote that, again, I'm not going to get directly um, is from this conversation between uh, Ian Malcolm and John Hammond and, you know, the other people in the room as Ian is struggling to stay alive. Uh, he ha has this debate with, you know, John throughout the entire book uh, and people just don't understand what he's saying about chaos theory and about how, you know, these kind of problems were always inevitable. Um, and towards the end, I think it might be Ellie actually who says, uh, you know, I'm trying to understand. So what you're saying is that, um, you know, we could destroy the world like we, we are potentially going to destroy the world and we being human beings uh, and the threat being like our modern science and our hubris and all of that. If we're not careful, we're going to destroy the world. Um, and, you know, I'm sh I don't blame somebody for hearing Ian Malcolm's sta statements and thinking that that's what he's talking about. But Ian just takes a long sigh. Uh, and I think he's like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. And basically the implication is like y people are so egotistical when it comes to science that they're only thinking of themselves and how they exist in the world. And if humanity dies, and if it's presented that humanity is going to die, then at, then that's the end of the world. But Ian's point is that even if you destroy the world and ruin what makes it, you know, uh, itself, what makes it innate, um, you know, if you change the way that it works, uh, uh, it will go on living without you. That's the real threat to humanity, is that the, the Earth will just erase right over you if you're not careful. And the fact that you're thinking about the world being destroyed instead of your humanity being destroyed is part of your hubris that's causing this problem. Um, and I just thought that was one of the most fascinating statements. Uh, there are a lot of comparisons made uh, talking about science being looked at like a religion, where people look at science as this infallible thing instead of this ever-evolving, changing concept, both the way people understand it and measure it, and also it existing in real life. Uh, another example that they give is oxygen and how oxygen was corrosive and dangerous until suddenly it was the most important thing on the planet and people needed it to live. Uh, that can change and it won't be the case. You know, radiation could kill everything, but eventually life will exist that needs radiation to survive if, you know, the conditions present themselves that way. And the approach to science as if it's this infallible thing um, is the same kind of... Uh, you know, ignorance that comes from people who are talking about worshiping science instead of religion. A lot of people, you know, worship religion as if it answers all of these questions and people who are into science will criticize people who are into religion for not being critical enough and not, you know, looking for more answers when in actuality, many people, but not all, many people who worship science are worshiping it in this very flat way that insists that it is, uh, you know, it is one size fits all or that, you know, it's the answer to everything. Um, and what's fascinating about that is not just that it's a fascinating statement in and of itself back when this book was written, but I feel like now more than ever, we're facing this now, you know, where people are like, your fa facts don't care about your uh, feelings or science uh, uh, doesn't care about your feelings or science doesn't change um the ignorance around science and people hailing science as if it's this like you know uh infallible thing is almost exactly what michael crichton is warning about in this book and what ian malcolm is warning about in this book where it's like science is an important tool but the minute you start using it as this uh you know uh never changing you know monolith this thing that is set in stone and uh isn't questioned or isn't updated then you start to lose yourself and i just think that's really fascinating uh it's it's presented really well in the book and i think it's really fascinating and honestly kind of sad how relevant it is now in uh, today's society in the end i gotta just reiterate how much i love this book so much uh it really surprised me i knew i was going to enjoy it um i never 
never had an issue with it, but it really did surprise me how much I enjoyed this revisiting of it. And uh, I probably will be re-listening to it soon just because of how taken I was by it, but I'm definitely gonna be checking out other Michael Crichton novels as a result, looking for a lot of the same stuff that I loved from this book. But this is definitely going into my, you know, favorite books, you know, ever written. Um, if I was gonna give this a score out of 20, as we all know, rating things out of 20 is normal. I don't need to remind you of that because all people do this, I, every country, every world. Um, uh, if I was gonna give this a grade out of 20, I'd probably give it an 18 out of 20, even though I love it and I might consider it one of my favorites. There are some details that I think are just okay. Like I mentioned, uh, I like all the characters and I think that the dialogue is serviceable, uh, serviceable uh, but I don't think that it's excellent. Uh, I think it's just kind of okay. Um, and that's because, again, there were different focuses uh, when it came to what Michael Crichton was trying to write about. And that's totally fine, uh, but I could see why somebody might be uh, uninspired by some of the exchanges between characters. Um, and then the other thing is just certain events I'm not the biggest fan of. I probably would have tweaked certain events um, uh, that felt like they didn't necessarily need to be there. Um, kind of like the raptor on the boat, which again, it wasn't necessarily the worst thing in the world, uh, but I felt like it was a little distracting at certain points and maybe certain, maybe the amount of references to it could have been decreased, but that's just me. Um, still great score, uh, an 18 out of 20. I think that's a great score. And for me, regardless of the score, it's definitely one of my favorite books, uh, moving forward. Now let's shift gears really quickly and talk about the physical copies of Jurassic Park and the copies that I happen to own. So I have a couple of copies of Jurassic Park from 1990. Uh, first of all, I have this hardcover copy and the bookstore that I bought it from said that it was a book club edition. Uh, when I looked at it, I immediately wondered because I hadn't really seen this version uh, before. Um, I immediately wondered if this was the first printing of Jurassic Park, which obviously is something that I would want. And I asked them, you know, if they knew what printing it was, and they answered that they were confused and they weren't sure, but they think that it was a book club book. Uh, apparently, you know, there are some uh, book clubs that will release specific versions of a book, uh, you know, with a different cover for just a, you know, a, a club like that or an event like that, which is obviously still cool, and I would want that to be a part of my collection. However, as I was doing research, uh, I've found that the first printing from my research, I could be wrong, but from my research, the first printing of Jurassic Park does look like this. And I've found a couple people selling, quote, first printing of Jurassic Park, and it looks like this. And it doesn't have a reprint number from what I can see from within the book. It doesn't say what year it was reprinted. Typically it'll say the year of publication and then the reprint year. So I think this might be the first printing of Jurassic Park, which in my, you know, case. I think that's awesome. I'm really excited about that. Uh, if you know whether or not this is the first printing, I'd love to uh, hear about it. Let me know in the comments below. But I'm still looking for other copies. Uh, but anyway, I really love uh, Jurassic Park as a book. Um, I was listening to the audiobook for this particular reread, um, but reading it physically is quite an experience, uh, in my opinion, because there are a lot of really cool little details. Like there are uh, little graphs and there's uh, data um, and there are um, these little illustrations on, um, you know, certain pages. Um, I just think that it's a really cool read um, when you're actually holding the book. And I think that that's really rewarding. I think, you know, listening to an audiobook has its own merits and its own, uh, you know, interesting details uh, about it. But I think they really made this book special and interesting um, with what's included. And I, whenever I think about the Jurassic Park book or whenever I'm listening to the audiobook, the first thing I'm thinking about is those missing elements that I, I don't get to see as often and that maybe a lot of people don't realize. So definitely a cool aspect of the book. Um, moving on, I think this is the second printing copy. Now, obviously, uh, this is not an initial printing, right? Um, it says, you know, his best to date. It's got reviews on it, three months on the New York Times bestselling list. Um, I think this is the copy that uh, Spielberg like took photos of uh, when they were filming the movie, actually. Um, from my knowledge, this is a reprint in 1991, so it would be the year immediately after the book's release. Um, and uh, it's just a paperback copy that is, uh, you know, pretty simple, uh, but definitely a cool copy to have because so many people had it back then. And I, I got to assume that if you were reading Jurassic Park uh, in the 90s, you were probably reading this copy. So definitely cool to have. And the last copy that I have is a reprinting from 2017. It is a beautiful black and red copy 
um, that I've never really seen a book like published like this. And I saw it immediately and I needed to have it. And it's uh, bigger than the other two copies that I have. Um, and it's just kind of a special edition version of the book. Uh, same book inside from what I can tell uh, and beautiful cover on the outside. So I'm really happy that it's a part of my collection. So as I mentioned, I was listening to the audiobook when I was rereading uh, the book, when I was rereading Jurassic Park. Um, and I wanted to talk about the circumstances of me listening uh, to the audiobook. Uh, I didn't just listen, I also played a video game, not the entirety uh, of the book, but for a little bit of it. And what I did was uh, something a little bit strange. So I played Far Cry 3 because I felt like the environment looked similar enough to Isla Nublar. Um, and I could just imagine dinosaurs. Uh, but then I was like, wait, I don't need to imagine dinosaurs. So on my left monitor, uh, while I was playing Far Cry 3 on my right monitor, I pulled up uh, Jurassic World Evolution footage um, and just had that going as B-roll in the background so it can kind of create that uh, you know, immersion. And then I was like, why stop here? Let's keep going. And so I played uh, rainy jungle ambience uh, sounds um, for background noise. And then the final thing was, well, I should get some music too, just to really set the mood. And I played the Doom 64 uh, soundtrack. Uh, I like my Doom music to be a little bit more up, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, energetic. Uh, but one of the things that's really interesting about the Doom 64 soundtrack is that it's very uh, droning. It's very, uh, you know, in the background. It, it, it's frightening. It's kind of uncomfortable and scary, but it doesn't really, uh, you know, jump, make you jump out of your skin, which is what I kind of needed, right? I needed good background music. And for me, I wanted creepy background music. And so I had all those videos and sounds going at once with these two different video feeds while I'm listening to Jurassic Park. And it's ridiculous, and I think that, that that's insane that I did all that, but at the same time, uh, it was actually kind of a fun experience, and I recommend it uh, if you're interested. Now with that out of the way, let's conclude the video by comparing the original Jurassic Park book to Jurassic Park the movie and the Jurassic Park film franchise. Now something that is really interesting to me and something that I wanted to talk about while reading the book was contrasting the novel of Jurassic Park to the 1993 film. I feel like there are a lot of interesting things to learn and uh, discuss based on whether they're different or the same. I think I've already explained that a lot of the focus of the book feels different than the movie. I feel like the movie is this, you know, kind of horror adventure. That's what I like to call it anyway. Um, and I feel like the book is more driven by science and more driven by uh, the twists of those uh, revelations. Um, that's like one of the biggest differences I've found. But other than that, reading the book was really interesting because it felt as if um, a lot of the sequences were similar enough to contextualize the book and the movie together, at least somewhat. Uh, I think this is a concept called soft canon, where something is similar enough where you can kind of assume certain things didn't happen in the source material and adopt other things. Um, I'm probably butchering that explanation. Uh, but just for example, like there are a number of scenes in the book that feel like they come immediately after um, the events of the movie. Um, one that comes to mind for me is with Dennis Nedry, where in the movie, you know, he mentions uh, Dodgson. This is Dodgson right here. Um, in, the, in the movie, it's just meant to be a funny joke. But in the book, they reveal that he was doing that for a specific reason, that he was doing that with a uh, the intention to record the fact that he was having this conversation with this person because he didn't trust that they wouldn't uh, betray him. And so I feel like, you know, if you wanted to, you could kind of assume that that is true in the movie as well. They just never said it. And I think there are a number of scenes and details in the book that feel that way, that to me feel like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Was this you know, uh, did, did this happen in the movie after the events of whatever we watched? Um, another one that comes to mind is the very end of the film and, you know, uh, uh, what happened to the characters in Jurassic Park once they, you know, got in that helicopter and left. Um, obviously, the ending of the book is drastically different than the ending of the movie, but I do wonder if they had a similar, um, you know, hostile treatment 
um, you know, after they left the island and after those events kind of became a little bit more public. Um, but in general, again, I, this isn't canon, like, right? Like, this is a, a, a different universe, if you want to call it that. It's a different version of the story, more accurately. But I do think that it's fun to do these little thought experiments, and I, I think if you wanted to, you could adopt a number of little details from the book uh, to the movie, and there wouldn't be much contradiction. Now, I might have forgotten a lot of the book from my first reading of it, but something that I didn't forget are a number of details that are taken from this first book and adapted throughout the Jurassic Saga. And when I say that, I mean movies one through three of Jurassic Park and the Jurassic World trilogy as well. Uh, something that I've always loved telling people is the, there are these little details that at least to me are consistently adapted throughout each of the movies. I feel like every single movie has just a little slice of the book still in it. And I just think that that's such a cool idea. Um, and I wanted to really quickly go over some of those similarities that I found that I think are obvious. And then some of the similarities that I'm wondering, you know, maybe aren't as obvious, but maybe they were still the inspiration for, right? Like, uh, I, I think there could, it could be possible. So let's get into that really quickly. So starting with the more obvious details, obviously John Hammond's death did not happen happen in the Jurassic Park movie, the first Jurassic Park movie. He did eventually die, but he didn't die the way that he did in the books. Uh, however, his compi attack was pretty clearly the inspiration for the compi attack in the Lost World uh, Jurassic Park, the second Jurassic Park film. Uh, that's a pretty clear adaptation in my opinion. Uh, Henry Wu is a character that we don't see a lot of in the original Jurassic Park movie, but is debatably a main character, or at least a very prominent, important character in the Jurassic World trilogy. And I think, I have to imagine, actually, that this character is adapted from this, this first book into that trilogy uh, a lot. Uh, I mean, even a lot of his dialogue is either, you know, augmented or, or potentially, you know, taken uh, completely and put into those movies. A lot of the concepts he talks about and a lot of the ideas he debates uh, are a part of that movie. So um, I, I got to imagine that he's adapted there. Um, there's a mention of the island being volcanic, and I know that there are other pieces of, uh, pieces of Jurassic media that inspire the uh, volcano um, in uh, Fallen Kingdom, but I was surprised to hear about the volcanic nature of the island in this first movie. Um, mentions of gas grenades is another one that's used in Jurassic Park 3. Lewis Dodgson is obviously in the first movie, but they expand upon him in D uh, Jurassic World Dominion. And then Biosyn is also expanded upon in Jurassic World Dominion. Um, and then moving away from there, there are the kind of, uh, you know, less obvious details. Like there's a scene involving a sleeping T-Rex. Was it possible that that scene inspired the scene from Fallen Kingdom where there's a sleeping T-Rex? Uh, there is a baby T-Rex. Did that inspire the baby T-Rex in uh, Jurassic World, uh, uh, or sorry, the Lost World Jurassic Park. Um, the divorce, there's discussions of a divorce, and did that inspire the conversations about divorce in Jurassic Park 3 and uh, Jurassic World? That one's a little bit more far-fetched, uh, but one that isn't, in my opinion, is the T-Rex waterfall scene that I couldn't stop thinking of the Lost World while it was happening. Um, traveling with a sleeping baby raptor, and just baby raptors in general, could that have inspired, uh, you know, the events in Jurassic World Dominion? To me, I think it's possible. Uh, there's even a scene where there's a collar being removed from a raptor, and I wonder if that also inspired this little moment in Fallen Kingdom. Uh, like I'm saying, oh, oh there's also the uh, toxic gas. They, they really mentioned this toxic gas like sticker or marking um, and how it could, you know, really harm. Um, you know, anyone, and it made me think again of Fallen Kingdom and, uh, you know, what kind of threatens the dinosaurs at the end of the film. Uh, my point is there are a lot of little details that, you know, could potentially just be coincidences, right? But they're also, you know, I, I can't help but wondering if these little ideas, these little small ideas did inspire the events in these movies. Uh, another one is the military on the beach. Um, at the end of Jurassic Park 3. Obviously, there are other reasons why the military arrives, uh, although maybe it's not the military, maybe it's the Navy. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if, you know, that conflicts, but, you know, I know that the, the history behind that and the uh, kind of conflict behind that ending, but I can't help but wonder, you know, is this ending of the book, 
in some way sharing something with that movie. Uh, even watching the island, you know, get bombed at the end reminded me of Fallen Kingdom uh, and watching the island, you know, be destroyed and the dinosaurs die. Like, it's a, a very sad, sad scene. Uh, dinosaurs escaping to the mainland. That was something that a lot of people didn't like about the Jurassic World series and were like, this is going too far. But that's like one of the first ideas in Jurassic Park, the original novel. Um, it's so interesting hearing people talk about how like, you know, the newer movies take it way too far. And yet I have all of these similarities that to me make a lot of sense. Um, the river uh, rafting scene with uh, the T-Rex swimming after them uh, reminded me a lot of Jurassic Park 3 um, and the Spinosaurus. Um, the baby Triceratops was another detail where I was thinking of Jurassic World, uh, and especially, uh, what was the Triceratops name? Uh, Ralph was the name of the baby Triceratops. And, uh, you know, especially the fact that they kept talking about riding Ralph. And I was like, this reminds me so much of, uh, you know, Jurassic World and how they had little rides. Is it possible that that part of that book was written down and we're like, you know, let's 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 in, implement this, even if other ideas kind of mixed with it later. Um, then, of course, there's the aviary, a big scene um, from the book that I think they probably tried to adapt a couple times in the films, but we didn't get to see until Jurassic Park three. Uh, but anyway, you get my point. Uh, my point being that there are a lot of obvious inspirations and there are a lot of obvious adaptations outside of the first Jurassic Park movie. The other five films, the other two Jurassic Park films and the other three Jurassic World films clearly do adapt concepts and scenes and even just dialogue from this original book. But, and I think that's cool in general. I just think that's such a cool, fun little idea that this book is, it's got so much in it that even so much time later and so many sequels later, we're still pulling information from it and, and ideas from it. But further than that, um, are there smaller ideas that were potentially uh, inspiring concepts and, you know, story beats in these movies as well? Uh, ideas that maybe we wouldn't typically look at as inspiration, uh, but maybe they were. I don't know. I just think that's interesting. Oh, one detail I did want to mention that I didn't know exactly where to fit is that the name Rexy, I'm pretty sure comes from from this book. I think the first time that the T-Rex is called Rexy is from this novel. And I just think that's interesting because obviously uh, the main T-Rex from the Jurassic Park movies and the Jurassic World movies is known as Rexy by the fans. And I always thought that was kind of a silly nickname. And yet the first novel introduces that name. And I just thought that was interesting. In the end, Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton, released in 1990, is a fantastic book in my opinion. And after rereading it, I've learned a lot more about this book on its own but also the Jurassic franchise in general. And I'm really happy and proud to say that this is definitely one of my favorite books ever written. And I highly recommend you check it out, especially if you're a Jurassic fan. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. I wanna thank you so much for watching. If for some reason you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and to subscribe to my channel for more. As regular viewers know, I make a variety of content on my channel and I'm always gonna make the videos that I wanna make. But if you see something you enjoy, make sure to let me know and I'll try to prioritize that kind of content in the future. Over on Twitch, I typically play superhero games like Marvel's Avengers and Gotham Knights, but I'll occasionally play a horror game like Resident Evil. So if that sounds interesting to you at all, make sure to check me out on Twitch at twitch.tv slash carrot scraps. And all my other social media, Twitch Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram are at Carrot Scraps as well. So I want to thank you again so much for watching, and I'll see you soon. All right, so this is going to be a weird one to explain, but I'm going to try my best. Uh, Michael Crichton is somewhat of an inside joke for myself personally, but then also my family and my friends. Um, and that started when we moved back in January of 2022. Uh, for some reason, I just started singing his name to the Sonic theme song, you know, like uh, Michael Crichton, Michael effing Crichton. Um, I just do that with names. I just do that with songs. I don't know what it is. I just I, I just start singing people's names or I start sing singing things that don't make any sense. Um, and me and my wife started doing that for a while. It transformed into Meekle Creakle, who was like this new creature. Uh, but then from there, it kind of like died off for a little bit. And on my wife's birthday, uh, during their birthday party, for whatever reason, I started singing about Michael Crichton again. I think, oh, I know what it was. We were playing rock band and I didn't know the lyrics to a song. So I just started singing about Michael 
Michael Crichton, and it was a hit, and people enjoyed it, and so everyone at that party bonded deeply with the Michael Crichton lore, and we all started singing his name to stuff. And long story short, trying to make this weird story as short as I can, this year we are celebrating a new holiday we created called Michael Crichton's Half Birthday, where we celebrate Michael Crichton's Half Birthday, and we eat Arby's, and we uh, make PowerPoint presentations uh, and poster board presentations. Oh, that's right. There's also an Arby's element. Uh, for whatever reason, I mixed Arby's into all of that, where Michael Crichton uh, owns an Arby's. And so you would do like, uh, Michael Crichton owns an Arby's. I don't know. You, you, it doesn't, it makes sense to me. He's Michael Crichton, he owns an Arby's, and you sing songs with those lyrics. What's so difficult to understand? 